Hey everybody, uh, today what we're going to work through are some measurement problems. You can see that up at the top of the screen. We're going to address some situations today that all involve measurement. They're going to be kind of a cumulative thing. So we're going to test our algebra skills and our measurement understanding. I want to jump right in with the first problem you see on the screen. What I'd like you to do is to find a fully simplified expression. So find an expression and then make sure that it is fully simplified. And we're gonna do two things for today. We're gonna find the perimeter of that shape and then what we're also gonna do is we're going to find the area of that shape. Okay, since this is a cumulative day, then what I want you to do is I want you to try all of these problems on your own. What's going to happen is we're going to have some situations arise for today that are going to require some discussion, but otherwise, I think you should have everything at your disposal, okay? I want you to pause the video and give it a shot. Let's start off with perimeter, okay? Pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So what I want to do is I want to kind of walk through two different ways to address the perimeter of the shape. First off, we should be good that perimeter is the distance around an object. So maybe what we do is we pick a spot, and I just X'd a corner on that diagram, and now we progress our way around that shape, just adding up all of the distances. So if I just got rid of that blue arrow and went back to that X, then maybe what I could do is I could slowly and methodically add up my distances around that shape. I'm coming up the far right side, and now I get to this distance that you see me highlight in blue where I don't know what that distance is. So maybe I just use a symbol to call it something that's missing. I do not want to call it X because I take a peek. There are X's in those dimensions. So maybe I just call it A. Well, down below that shape, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the length of A. For me to find A, A would have to be the difference, okay? The difference between all the way across the bottom and then me subtracting the part that I know. That would leave me with the part that I don't know, the length of A. So if you take a peek, what I have is the pink across the bottom, which would be 5x plus 3. And then I have the green that I can see highlighted up at the top. I would have to subtract and make sure that we subtract the whole dimension, so you see my brackets around, that 2x minus 4. Okay, I could clean that up pretty quickly. I've got a 5x minus 2x, so there's a 3x, and I have a 3 subtract a negative 4, there is a positive 7. So I just found out that that missing dimension of a was 3x plus 7. And so I can continue to add it on. I'm really starting to run out of room over here. And then I could go and do the exact same thing for this next missing side, and maybe I just call it B. Okay, if you hit a snag with dealing with those missing sides, those unlabeled sides, then I think you have an opportunity to try this one on your own now to find the length of B. Okay, I want you to pause the video and we'll come back and we'll see if we match up on that length of B. Okay, pause it now. Okay, we're back. So if I went through and I just got rid of those other colors that I labeled and I did the same thing as what we did before, for me to find the length of B, I need to take all the way down that vertical side and then subtract the amount I know. You'll notice that that x plus 8 
is part of the way. And if I subtract that from the whole thing, I'll be left with the part that's missing. So if I take my 3x minus 1 and I now subtract the entire x plus 8, and I'm just going to slide that up a little bit, then that is going to give me a 2x minus 9. Okay, there's my dimension of b. And now I could add that on. And man, am I running out of room up here. This is a big, long expression. Don't forget to add on the last dimension that we knew. Wow, this is getting ugly. And there is me traveling around that entire shape. So all I'm going to do is just get rid of the pink. And I'll get rid of that green. I got back to the X that I started with. And there are all my sides. Okay, I created this big, long, ugly expression. Now what I need to do is make sure I do the red. I need to make sure that I fully simplify it. So I'm going to take my time and I'm going to collect like terms. I've got an x plus a 5x is 6x plus a 3x is a 9x plus another 3x is a 12x plus a 2x is a 14x plus another 2 I have 16 x's when I go through and I collect every single one of those x terms. Now I have to do the same thing with my constants. An 8 plus a 3 is 11. Minus 1 is a 10. Plus 7 is a 17. Minus 9 is an 8. Minus 4 is a positive 4. And there is my perimeter. Okay, how do we match up? Hopefully not too bad. We got down to the same expression. We're good. Now, what I want to talk about relatively quickly is that I think that this was the slow and methodical way to tackle this problem, but I don't think it's the best way to have done it. If you take a look, you had to go through and find those missing dimensions that I just boxed in in red. That was some extra work. If I could avoid having to do that, I would love to. The next part, look at the length of that expression that I created. Like there's a lot of terms in there. And so the action to go through and simplify that, it would have been really easy to make a collecting mistake. So if I could figure out a way to shrink down that expression, that would be a lot easier for me. Less risk for mistake. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to erase that entire solution with the idea that we know our perimeter is 16x plus 4. Okay, we've already found that out. I'm going to get rid of everything we did because if I was to tackle that problem, I wouldn't do it that way. That there's actually a faster way for me to work through the perimeter of that shape. And it is very particular to this kind of like L shape. You know, the block attached to another block. Okay? I am fine to do what I'm about to do because all of these corners are right angles. And I would need to know that to be able to do what I'm about to do. Okay, if I recognize that my perimeter is the distance around a shape, then it doesn't really matter where that distance lies as long as it's on the outside of the shape. And so, like, for me to get around my shape, I would have to add a 5x plus 3. Then I would have to add a 3x minus 1. Now... This is where we had to do some extra work we could have avoided. Look at my horizontal sides. At the top, I'm going to have to take this pink dimension. And I'm eventually going to have to add this green dimension. But what I'm hoping that you can see is, 
if I take the pink and I add it to the green, the pink added to the green, I just get another blue. That if I look all the way down at the bottom of that shape, that is the pink plus the green put together. Like, in fact, my pink plus my green just gives me another 5x plus 3. And if I did the same thing on the, hor- on the vertical sides, let me get rid of my pink and my green. That me all the way down the right side was 3x minus 1. But this value I would have to find... But if I add it to that value, the pink plus the green, then it again has to give me all the way down my 3x minus 1. In essence, what I'm doing is I'm doing this. I am saying that I don't care where the pink and the green lie. I really have all the way across on the top. That would take care of that 2x minus 1 dimension and just give me another 5x plus 3 all the way across. But I could do the same thing, and instead of thinking of that dimension there, I could think of it out here, and therefore I am all the way up and down the side, another 3x minus 1. So when I'm finding my perimeter, really what I'm doing is I'm just finding the perimeter of a rectangle, even though my actual shape is in a rectangle. So what is the fastest way for me to deal with this? Well, I could calculate it as two of my lengths plus two of my widths and just use my relationship of a rectangle. When I go and clean that up now, look how much easier it is for me to simplify that expression. And there is my good old 16x plus 4. Okay, that might be something that you really like to use. I want you to keep in mind that concept when we move forward. Okay, that can really help out. A, and in creating the original expression but maybe most importantly in simplifying it. Okay, there is the first half of the first problem. We just went through and we found the perimeter. Now what I want us to do is the second part. I want us to go through and find the area. So we have another moment to try this one on our own. I want you to take a moment and I want you to try to find the area of that shape on your own. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So what I'm going to do is just get rid of all of that blue because now we're finding the purple. Um, For us to go through and find the purple, the area of that shape, I'm going to have to take that irregular shape and I'm going to have to break it up into regular shapes. Now, I've got a bunch of options as to how I could deal with this. I could drop in a height here And now make this maybe rectangle one, box one, and this box two. Unfortunately, that means I'd have to figure out what that dimension was. Or I could now take and chop off that top, for instance, and make this a big box one. But then for me to figure out box two, I need to find both of those dimensions. So that seems less efficient. A third option would be make it a regular shape and just find the area of the whole rectangle, this whole thing, and then subtract out the part that's missing. Same thing, though, that's going to require me to have to figure out what that dimension is to be able to calculate the area of the rectangle I need to subtract. So we have a few different ways to tackle it. 
I think we can see the first or the third option is the best. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just drop in a height here. I'll call that box one, that box two, and I'll find whatever I need. Okay, maybe I do this in its bits. Maybe I do it as one big expression. I don't really care. So what maybe you do is you say you're going to find the area of box one separately, which would be a length times a width. And now you could simplify that expression on your own and say, okay, well then expand those brackets or a 2x squared, I'd have a minus 4 plus a 16, so that's a positive 12x minus 32. And maybe we come up with something like that. You would now go ahead and find the area of box 2. So what I want you to do, take a moment, if I've caught up with you, Try to go through and find the area of box two on your own. Okay? Pause the video now. Otherwise, you're coming along with me. We would need to know what that dimension is for A. We already did that when we found perimeter, but I'll go through it again. For me to find the dimension of A, I need to take all the way across the bottom and then subtract the part I know. So that gets me a 3x and a plus 7. So if I wanted to now, I could find the area box 2 by taking my length times my width. And now I can simplify that, expand it to a positive 21 minus 3. And now, to come up with the area of the total, I could simply add those two boxes together. If you wanted to create one big expression at the beginning, feel free. x plus 8 times 2x plus, or minus 4 plus 3x minus 1 times 3x plus 7. Feel free. But I'm also okay with you finding them separately and then adding everything together to come up with your area of your total. Okay, there we go. We were able to go through and come up with the perimeter and area for that irregular shape. Nice. Okay, I want to jump into the next problem now. So there is our shape again. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to put on so we can see the dimensions we have. We were able to find that the perimeter was 16x plus 4. And we were able to find out that our area was 11x squared plus 30x minus 39. Just so we can see it on the screen together. Okay, I want you to take a moment now and to go through and try to answer both problems A and B. So for problem A, if x equals 3, find the perimeter. And for problem B, if the area is 17 units squared, find the value of x. Okay, I want you to tackle both of those. We'll come back and we'll see how we match up. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So, for us to answer problem A, if x equals 3, find the perimeter, well, that's pretty straightforward. We can now just sub in an x equals 3. So, in my perimeter, I've got my 16 times 3, add on my 4. That is a 48 plus 4, and that gets me to 52. It doesn't tell me what units I have, so you can just leave your answer as 52. If you want to, though... You can write in units, and you're good. But I'm fine if you just want to leave it as 52. Okay, problem B. Problem B may have added a little bit of difficulty. For problem B, it now tells us what the area is, and we have to kind of go backwards and find the value of x. So that would be a case where we are now subbing in an a value of 17. 
Okay, so 17 equals 11x squared plus 30x minus 39. You'll notice that now we created an equation. That equation now has to be solved. Okay, I cannot collect my x's into one variable term, so I got to bring that 17 over. And if I'm going to do that, I have to subtract 17. That's going to give me a negative 56, and now that equals 0. Okay, I'm going to shrink this down just a little bit, and here's where we kind of come to that decision we had to a couple units ago. How fast are you at trying to factor that expression? versus using quadratic formula. That I would love it if we looked at it and we said, okay, uh, two numbers that multiply to give 11, that's kind of nice because 11's prime. Now, 56, we have a bunch of different numbers. Like maybe we look at 56 and we go eight and seven. I'm hoping that when we start to do that, we recognize 77 or 88, depending on how we go with a seven or an eight, that's not going to get us anywhere close to 30, so that wouldn't work. You would then take a look at it and say, well, how else could I break up 56? Well, if it was 8 times 7, 8 is a 4 times a 2, so you could go 14 and 4. Well, that might get us a little bit closer. What if we went 14 and 4? Now, when I multiply across, there's a 44, there's a 14. I can get 30 out of that. Now, you may have just said, hey, you know what? I would have been faster to just use quadratic formula. That's okay. But if we get better and we keep practicing our factoring, this can become the faster way. We'll notice that a positive 44 and a negative 14 gets us to our positive 30. We can now factor. Put in your brackets and your variable. And now we come in on that x has to be 14 elevenths or negative 4. Nice. Okay, we think we may be done. Or perhaps we think we're done. This is where we have to be careful. You take a look and you just found values for x that make the area of that shape 17. That's what we did in the red. But now maybe we got to take a peek at that and say like, okay, but, but is that possible? Okay, let's take the easiest one for us to check. Let's take a look at the 4. Or specifically, I should say, the negative 4. If x equals negative 4, if that's a possibility, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that negative 4 and I'm going to examine it in the diagram. Like, let's just take the side that it looks like I'm pointing my arrow to. That 3x minus 1. If I allow x to be negative 4 then this dimension would be 3 times negative 4 minus 1. Um, that's negative 13. How can you draw a shape, build a shape, that has a dimension of negative 13 units? You can't. So even though we were able to solve the equation and get a solution for x of negative 4, that doesn't make our shape possible. So I'm going to get rid of that blue. I never have to see that. You can instead just do a mental check. And when you do, if you find that that negative 4 doesn't work, then we need to make sure that we label it as in ad missable. And there we go. Inadmissible is your label that says you have a solution to an equation. That is an algebraic solution. Negative four makes that equation work. 
but you cannot accept it because it doesn't fit the application. Negative four is a solution to that equation that I just started. But it's not a solution when the equation has a context. When all of a sudden, it represents a part of a shape. So that's what we have to be careful of. Okay, so we tend to then say, okay, well then therefore x equals 14 elevenths, that's my solution. And then we got to stop for a second. Because if we can recognize that you cannot have a negative dimension, then maybe we can scan around that shape and see, could any other dimension be made negative by x equaling 14 elevenths? Well, if I take a peek at the bottom one that I just circled in purple, 5 times some number, 14 elevenths, that's positive, Add more, that's going to work. Nice. 14 elevenths plus 8, that's positive. What about the 2x minus 4? So, if I went and subbed my x equals 14 elevenths in to that dimension, 2x minus something, then I'm going to do a check and see... Does that make my shape possible? I'll get my common denominator. And now when I put that together, I go, oh no. I have another negative dimension. And as soon as I have a negative dimension, then that means I cannot accept the other solution either. It's also inadmissible. Okay, let me get rid of all that purple for my check. Because I found out that to make the area 17, the only way that can happen is if x equals 14 elevenths or negative 4. And both of those solutions I can't accept because they would create negative dimensions. So what's the only conclusion that I could draw? Well, there actually is no solution to that equation because both of the solutions I cannot accept. And if that equation was produced because we were making the area 17, then our conclusion is therefore the area cannot be 17 units squared. Okay, I want to make sure that you don't think, hey, well, that was like a trick question. You were trying... No. That just, I think, shows or hopefully represents to you some of the complexity that we have to consider as soon as our equations have an application. We need to make sure that we check our answers to see, even though they may be an algebraic solution, are they a solution to the problem that was posed? Okay, we worked our way through our first problem. I hope that that's helped to address a number of issues that we can encounter when dealing with some measurement problems. Okay, let's jump into our next problem. Okay, so here is our second problem. Similar to the first, we have to come up with a fully simplified expression. This time, you'll notice we've got a 3D shape in front of us. So we're going to come up with the surface area of that shape or the area of the shape and the volume. Okay, so same as the last one. I want you to be able to try this one on your own. We should be comfortable in doing so. Okay, then we'll come back and we'll see how we match up. Okay, pause the video now. Okay, we're back. So um, I'll just do the same thing. I'll go left to right this time and I'll come up with the area and then the volume. So let's start off with the area. Um, you could have, if you wanted to, spent some time trying to memorize the formula for area of a box, a rectangular prism. I would hope you didn't. Um, I would hope that it's actually a pretty natural thing for us or it's something that we can just build all the time. 
I want us to take a look at the picture because I'm hoping that we can recognize that a box is made up of a series of the same shapes. So when we talk about the area, like you're gonna have the front and the back of the box that are going to be the same shape. You're also going to have the sides of that box that would be the same. And then you would have the top and the bottom that would be the same. So if I was to build my formula for that, really it's just a series of rectangles. I'm gonna build it in the shape that I have. So I could start off and state that my area is, now the front and the back, the two blue rectangles. That would be length times width. And the width of that blue is the height of the box. So I can see then that the width of that blue is an x plus 1. Now, a little bit different than the last problem. Last time when we found area, we found the area of its parts, and in the end we went through and we collected. I'm going to do this one different. I'm going to build the area of the whole box in one expression. So that blue that you see would represent the area of the rectangle that I can see. My issue then becomes, if I get rid of my a equals, I need two of them because I have the front and the back. And now what I can do is I can start to build. So let's say I take my next two and maybe I go to my greens. My greens would be my two sides. So I would have two of the boxes x plus 4 by x plus 1. And then I would have my pinks, my top and my bottom. So I would have two of my rectangles that are 2x minus 3 by x plus 4. And there we go. That is me just building it. Um, for some of you, you may know the relationship that your area is two length widths plus two width heights plus two length heights. What you'll notice is in that expression, it's every combination of length, width, and height, but once. So you'll notice that I never duplicate a length with a width and then later on a length with a width or so on. So when you start to scan through all my pairings, you'll notice that I took each one of those dimensions and I paired it up with another dimension only once. Okay, there is my construction of my expression for area. Now the rest is all algebra. So if you struggled to build that expression, then what I want you to do is take a moment and get a little extra algebra practice. Let's see if we can expand those brackets, collect like terms and get to the same thing. Okay, try it on your own, pause it now, or you're coming along with me. Okay, I am going to expand my binomials first, then double it. So just as we went through and dealt with all of our algebra, we're going to do the same thing now. So if I expand, I get a 2x squared, double it, 4x squared. My middle term would be a 2x minus 3x is a negative 1x, double it. Negative 3, double it. There's my blue. Do the same thing with my green. Expand it, double it. When I multiply those, I'm going to get a 5x, double it. I'm going to get a positive 4, double it. Same thing with my pink. Expand it, 2x squared, double it. My middle term would be a 5x, double it. My last term is a negative 12, double it. And there are all my brackets expanded. Now, I'm just going to flip back into blue. Since I circled area in the question in blue, I'll put my final answer in blue. And so if I collect all my x terms, I'm going to get a 10x squared. If I collect all my single x terms, I'm going to get a positive 18 of them. And if I collect all of my constants, I'm going to get a negative 6 and negative 24 is negative 30. Add on 8, negative 22. And hopefully we matched up in the end. 
So if you were able to go through and get that area expression, I think you are doing pretty well, like actually very well. Okay, how well did we do? So hopefully we match up, we're all good, and now we can move on to volume. Okay, to do that, I'm just going to erase all of that stuff that we have. I want to make sure that we're good to be able to jump in with some space. So if I just get rid of all of that, and I'm going to get rid of all of my colors on my diagram because I don't need those anymore. There we go. Okay, if we were to go through and figure out volume, I think volume is actually the easier one to create because for most of us, we would recognize our length times width times height relationship. So for me to come up with volume, then I need one dimension times another dimension times the last dimension. And there is our volume. Okay, but we need to make sure that it is fully simplified. So I need to expand those brackets. I think because the first one has got the coefficient of two on it, like when I take a look at that first, it's got a two. When I expand all these brackets, it's gonna give me stuff that's bigger. I think what I would do is I'm gonna leave that two X minus three until the end. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to not touch that first factor. And now I'm going to expand the last two because that becomes really fast for me to multiply. Okay. Now this line is optional to you. You now have to take your two things and multiply it by your three. So you can very slowly and methodically take the 2x and multiply it in to everything. Then take the minus three and multiply it in to everything. And then in the end, collect. But I think some of us would actually get pretty good at being able to go through and expand and collect all in one go. That is, if you took a look back at that purple, you might go, well, that's the only cubed term I'm going to get. So that's an easy one. Now, how am I going to get my squared terms? Well, if I take an x times an x, that's a squared or a constant times an x squared. So maybe you can already start to see that there's a positive 10x squared minus a 3x squared, and you can start to collect in one go, okay? Okay. That is your call. You decide how you want to go through and simplify. So I can go through and I can collect and we should have got down to. That is our final expression. Okay. I'm hoping that we are good and that everything matched up in the end and we were quite comfortable to A, create the expression but then also to finish it off, the rest becoming just some algebra and we'll be good to go through and simplify. Okay, similar to the last problem, let's jump into the last part. I'm going to do the same thing again and I'm just going to go through and remind ourselves so we don't have to keep looking around that there was my area expression and then there is my volume expression. I think that just makes it easier so we can see everything in front of us. Okay, I think you should be good to now try A and B all by itself, yourself. I think given our discussion in problem one, you should actually start to feel more confident in doing this one on your own. Okay, pause the video now. We'll see how we match up. Okay, we're back. So the first one, I need to sub in my x value of 5, and I am subbing it into my volume. If x equals 5, what do we end up getting? So I'm going to calculate every power as I go. So when I sub in 5, I'm going to cube it. There's my 125. I'm going to square it. There's my 25. The next ones, I can simplify as I go. And I can come in on that pretty quick. I can collect 
each individual, or sorry, simplify each individual term. Seven quarters is a buck 75. So there's my 175. I think I'm going to collect on the end too, just to speed up the process a little bit. And now I'm going to hopefully be able to go through and add my 250 plus my 125. There's a 425. Now, if I subtract off 47, I'm hoping that we are coming in on 378. Again, I don't care about units because the diagram didn't give me units. But if you are going to put on units, make sure that you denote that that's units cubed now for volume. Okay, I'm going to put a little wavy line down. And I think we should have been okay on B. Now we're talking about if the area is 58. So I need to sub in an A value of 58. That means that I'm going to end up with 58 is equal to 10x squared plus 18x minus 22. And now I've just created an equation. I should be good to solve. So I can deal with my 10x squared, my positive 18x. I have to get rid of a plus 58, so I'm going to minus 58, and that is going to give me a 70, 80 equals zero. Now we take a look at all three of those terms, and I'm hoping we recognize that they're all even. So I could divide out a two from every single one of those terms, and that at least shrinks down the numbers I have to work with to that. That's not too bad. Okay, I'm going to tackle the same thing. So I'm going to take a quick peek and see, does that factor? Because that 5 is prime, it at least speeds up the process a little bit. I'm now looking for a combination of 40 that's going to give me my 9. Well, if I go 4 and 10, then there's a 50 and a 4. No way. 10 and 4, there's a 20 and a 10. Nope. So then that means that maybe I've got like an 8 and a 5. There's 25 and 8. A 5 and an 8. There's 40 and 5. Yikes. 20 and 2 isn't going to get me any. Okay. It looks like I have no combination. So what I'm going to do now is default. If I can't factor it, then I have my quadratic formula. So therefore, x equals my negative b plus or minus the square root of my b squared minus my 4 times my 5 is 20 times my negative 40. So that's going to give me a positive 800 all over 2 times a. Nice. Okay, I need to clean that up really quickly. That is going to give me my negative 9 plus or minus the root of 881 over 10. Okay, now is where we need to have a discussion. So, back in our quadratic units, this is where we would have now taken that quadratic formula value, that irrational value, and you would have said, okay, I'm looking for two numbers to multiply to give 881 and you were going to try to reduce your radical. Okay, this is where we have a different process. Let's say that 881 would factor in a way that would allow that to reduce. Let's just say it would. And let's say you could shrink that whole thing down. I would hope that at the very least, the most simplified that could be, you would end up recognizing that like you could have a plus or a minus your B, and I'll just call it B. I know it's negative B, but let's just call it B. Plus or minus, like, I don't know, I'll pick a number here, 4 root 13. Let's just say it's that. If I was to ask you, find the value of X that makes that work, we have to look back at what is the application. X is being used to generate a dimension. How can you have a dimension that would be like, I don't know, 5 plus or minus 4 root 13? How could you have a length that could ever end up being 9 plus 4 root 13? 
If I asked you, hey, on your ruler, show me a length of 9 plus 4 root 13, you should look at me weird. Because we don't talk that way. Nobody does. That when we go through and we deal with an application setting, we are dealing with approximates. Which means you're allowed to round the red. Now, what I cannot have you do is round root 881 and get an approximate, then use that approximate to go and find other things. That is way too much rounding, way too much. So what we're going to do is we're going to find our approximate solutions right now. So you're going to take negative 9 and you're going to add it to the root of 881 equals and divide that by 10 and come up with an approximate. Now, there is no inherent rounding rule to what we're working with, so we fall back on our default of two decimal places, and you should get approximately 2.07. Or you're now going to find the other solution. So we're going to take our negative 9, and we're going to subtract more. Yes, I recognize that you may be able to tell right now you're going to get a negative x value that is going to have to be inadmissible. You still have to find it. You can't stop short. So when I take my negative 9 minus my root 881, then divide that by 10, I'm going to get a negative 3.87. Okay. Okay. We take both those values and we look back. My negative 3.887, I can tell is not going to work for that dimension. And as soon as I find one dimension it doesn't work with, that is good enough. I can label that as inadmissible. I cannot accept it. Don't make the mistake of therefore the other one works. Let's do a check. Clearly, if I sub that into that dimension, I'm adding more to it, so it's fine. 2.07 plus 4, I'm adding more to it, so it's fine. Okay, 2x minus 3, because I'm subtracting something from it, there could be the potential to get to a negative value. So I only have to do a quick mental check in my head. If I take 2 times 2 and a bit, that's 4 and a bit. 4 and a bit minus 3 still gives me a positive value. I know I am good. 2.07 is my approximate solution for that problem. Nice. Okay, there we go. I'm just going to make sure we can see everything. I think by us tackling these two problems that you've worked through today, I think that gives you enough to be able to work through a bunch of other application problems that all deal with measurement. My important thing that I need to tell you is expectation level for our course. You'll notice we addressed a composite figure in the first problem, and you'll notice that we addressed a regular rectangular prism, a box in our second problem. You are responsible for knowing all of your measurement uh, formulas, relationships, for any of the shapes that we cover in our lesson or in our assigned practice. If I was to throw a different shape at you, like for instance, I gave you a trapezoid and all of a sudden I gave you a problem that dealt with a trapezoid. I would not expect you to know the formula for area of a trapezoid. If you do, outstanding. If you don't, no worries. I would give you that formula on an evaluation, okay? However, any shapes that have been included in your lesson or your practice, you are responsible for knowing. Okay, your job now, jump in and get as much practice as you can that you are comfortable. Okay, best of luck.